background really started in feedlot management, as Jacob said. Uh, part of my job before coming here was in extension. Uh, I spent 35 years either running a research feedlot or being the researcher at that feedlot. Um, so I was asked to talk about basics of feedlot management. So I'm going to give you a lot of information tonight, but basically I'm going to give you an overview of the major issues that people run into. Uh, important considerations, if you've never gotten into cattle feeding before, animal health background is really important. An appropriate diet is really important. Avoiding grain processing mistakes go right hand in hand with feed monk management and preventing acidosis. And I'm, these are the areas that I'm going to cover tonight. So the first thing you need to know is that there is a hierarchy of nutrient use. It goes maintenance, development, growth, lactation, reproduction, and fattening. In feedlots, hopefully we don't have lactation and reproduction. The important thing about maintenance is that 50% of an animal's daily caloric intake and 40% of an animal's daily protein intake go towards maintaining nothing but the gut and the organs associated with it. That rumen, reticulum, omasum, abomasum, small intestine, large intestine, liver and kidneys, they take half the maintenance. So a real key thing that we do in feedlots is we try to minimize the amount of fiber in feedlot diets because as we increase fiber in the diet, it increases the gut size. And one of the reasons that feedlots are more efficient than pasture cattle is because we can reduce that gut size by 20%, reducing maintenance requirements for energy by 10% as we move cattle from a forage diet and get them on a grain diet. I think it's important that we understand industry averages. And this is the most recent stuff out of Kansas State at September closeouts. The average time on feed for steers was 164 days, for heifers was 158. Steers gain more than heifers normally. Steers are averaging 3.6 pounds a day, heifers 3.2. We are down at around six pounds of feed per pound of gain on a dry matter basis. Dry matter basis just really means when we've removed the water and we're under one and a half percent death loss. So if you're trying to benchmark yourself and how well you're doing on your farm, these are actually the industry averages. An important thing to look at is that fourth column on the left. Our cattle are big. When we, when we are selling feeder calves in a feeder calf state, we have to understand that in feedlots, they're taking those animals to 13 to 1400 pounds. Now this final weight's a little higher than we're getting with Angus cross cattle because about 20% of the cattle that we feed are Holsteins and those go to about 1,600 pounds in many cases. But still, we're having to take these, these British breed crosses to about 1,300 to 1,350 pounds. First thing that I wanna emphasize is that you get what you pay for. And reputation cattle are really important to the feedlot industry. Order buyers make money in this industry by buying someone else's mistakes and putting them together and getting them healthy. But when you are a farmer feeder, you are trying to get healthy cattle in. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what goes into making cattle the kind of cattle that you want to feed. And I'm starting back way before that calf is born because a lot of people don't realize this. Muscle development of a calf actually starts in mid-gestation before it is born. Tissue development for fat tissue, which is called adipose tissue, starts in the last third of gestation or the last third of pregnancy. And so this is a really important slide. If I am buying cattle for myself, I want to know that that cow herd that I'm buying those calves from has their cows in about a body condition score five 
during mid and late gestation. I want to know that they have a good mineral program because minerals like copper and zinc and manganese, they're what's called cofactors in energy metabolism in the liver. And if that cow is going to nourish that fetus appropriately, she has to have good nutrition and often that means good mineral nutrition. We make a huge mistake when we buy calves from places that don't have a good mineral program or don't take good care of the, their cows from a body condition standpoint because by the time we get them after weaning, their, their genetics may be fine. That producer may have purchased a really good bull, but if they didn't take care of the cows from a nutrition standpoint and a body condition standpoint, the offspring aren't going to have the potential to grow in the feedlot the same way that they would have had the cow been maintained properly. To me, this is not a mineral program. A mineral program needs to be something that the cattle consume, and it needs to be in a form of mineral that is actually absorbable by the cow. Um, I have a basic rule that the only mineral I will allow in the oxide form in any mineral that I feed to my own cattle is magnesium. Magnesium oxide is the only thing in the oxide form I will feed. I want my minerals to be in sulfates or carbonate form, uh, late gestation, early lactation, maybe some chelates, but we have to really do a lot better job of paying attention to mineral nutrition of the cow herd, especially if we're feeding these calves ourselves. Okay, so what's my message on this point of the presentation? Buy calves from graded seals or from reputation herds with a good mineral program. If you're feeding your own calves, keep your cows in a good body condition score of at least five so that they can produce a high quality colostrum. And you need to understand one huge thing. Colostrum is only produced in the last five weeks of pregnancy. So if that cow is in poor body condition score or she is losing tissue weight as that calf is growing in that last third of gestation, it's growing about nine tenths of a pound to a pound a day. If she is thin, she's not gonna have a high quality colostrum. These calves are born without immunity. And we have to get colostrum into those calves within the first six hours, preferably because that gut starts to close up and it can't absorb it. And calves that don't get a good quality colostrum are five to nine times more likely to die prior to weaning, and they're about five times more likely to die as sudden death syndrome calves in the feedlot. Okay, so I want to switch a little bit now and talk about starch digestibility. And on the right side of this screen, I've got whole corn and on the top, and I've got finely ground corn on the bottom. And one thing that I've noticed, we have a lot of people that feed their corn looks a lot more like the corn on the bottom than the corn on the top. And I want to talk a lot about that today. This is glucose. It's just the sugar glucose. Both starch and cellulose are made from glucose. The only difference between these two is how they are linked. On the top of this slide, I have starch. And if you notice that the little oxygens between the starch, the arrows point down. Cellulose points up. That's the only difference that, that there is between starch and cellulose. And the bacteria that are in the rumen digest one of these two forms. Very few of the bacterial species digest both of them. So that the reality of it is, a lot of what we do from diet formulation is based upon economics, but the diet that we feed in feedlots ought to be balanced for energy and for starch content. And here's why we don't want a lot of cellulose in a feedlot diet. Cellulose comes from forage. On the left-hand side of this screen, I have a forage at the top, I have a 100% forage diet. At the bottom, I have a 20% forage, 80% grain diet. Well, at 100% forage, 
under that acetate, it's 70% acetate and 16% propionate. Go all the way over to the right and just assume butyrate's always around 10%. But on 100% forage, I've got 70% acetate and 16% propionate. Now, if I go down to the bottom row where I'm only feeding 20% forage, but I'm feeding 80% starch or grain or corn, I get 80, I get 50% acetate roughly, but my propionate nearly doubles. It goes to 30%. The reason we have feedlots is to increase that propionate percentage because that makes our cattle more efficient. It's one of the reasons that we have feedlots. The reason is that acetate, it only goes three places. It goes to back fat, seam fat, which is the fat between muscles, and milk fat. It doesn't go to muscle growth or to marbling hardly at all. Propionate is converted to glucose in the liver with no loss of carbon. So when we feed a high grain diet from an environmental standpoint, it's actually more efficient environmentally with less carbon loss through carbon dioxide and methane than forage digestibility. But the important thing is that propionate is converted to glucose. When we feed high grain diets that increase propionate production, it's the only one converted to glucose in the liver. High levels of glucose in the liver result in a greater average day, more lean tissue growth per day, and more marbling per day. In addition to that, as we reduce the fiber, we shrink the gut size, and the animal becomes more efficient because we reduce that maintenance requirement if you go back to that hierarchy of nutrient use, that is maintenance, development, growth, lactation, reproduction, and fattening. So this is why feedlots feed high grain diets, not high forage diets. We want rapid growth, we want efficient gain, and we want marbling. So now let me talk a little bit about starch digestibility, because we have a lot of misconceptions out there in the industry. Rumen bacteria are responsible for digesting most of the feed. They release enzymes that do the digestion. Those enzymes are on the outside of the bacteria. Anything we, reduce, we do to reduce the surface area of the feed or reduce the particle size by grinding allows more bacterial attachment. With a forage diet, there's only about one to three billion bacteria per milliliter of rumen contents, and the milliliter is a cc. With the grain-based diet, there are about eight to 10 billion bacteria per milliliter of rumen contents. Well, when I get eight to 10 billion bacteria per milliliter of rumen contents, and I take a grain like corn, and I finely grind it, and I make a lot of surface area, because if you think how much surface area there is in a whole kernel that those bacteria have to get in through that kernel versus all the surface area available for digestion with ground corn, that's how we run into acidosis. Now I'll explain that as we go along. Grains are ranked by their rate of starch digestion. The fastest are wheat and barley, followed by high moisture corn, steam flake corn, dry rolled corn, and the slowest that we normally feed are dry whole corn. So dry whole corn is very slow to be digested, it takes about six to 12 hours. Wheat and barley, they have to be ground because they're small. They can be digested, that starch can be digested in one to two hours. So why is that important? This is a graph showing ruminal pH. What I want you to see is that on all the way on the left hand side where it says 8 a.m., 8 o'clock, that's when animals are fed. Feeding occurs really at one time. They eat a lot of feed. And right above that, that room and pH line that is in red, it drops. So about six hours after feeding, it's at its lowest point. Now, if you look all the way over to the right, that lowest point takes you to a pH of about five. Well, let me explain pH to you. pH of seven is neutral. pH, what pH measures 
It's actually the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, which is a fancy way of saying more hydrogen ions, which create acids. If I go from a pH 7 to a pH of 6, it's a base 10 log. So there's 10 times more hydrogen ions at a pH of 6 than at a pH of 7. If I go from a pH of 6 to a pH of 5, there's another 10 times more hydrogen ions. So there's 10 times more hydrogen ions between 7 and 6 and 10 times more between 6 and 5, and I multiply those. So at a pH of 5, there's 100 more acid units or hydrogen ions than at a pH of 7. And forages normally are digested at about a pH of 6, 7, 6, 8. So we're dealing with a really different deal. We're, we have 100 times more acid units with high grain diets than we do with high forage diets. Now, if I get subacute acidosis, and this normally occurs when cattle overeat, where we're given just too much, what you see happen is that that pH drops not to five, but it can go all the way down to four and a half. And what happens is when those cattle overeat one day and they have a really low pH and they get a subacute acidosis, they don't want to eat a lot the next day. They have a stomach ache. And we have to really avoid this. This is our number one culprit in feedlots is acidosis because it steals money from us. And I'll, I'll show you how here in a little bit. But I'm going to kind of focus on corn here because that is the majority of what we feed in feedlots. Now, this shows the dry matter intake of corn in various ways. Dry rolled corn has the highest intake. Steam rolled corn or steam flake corn and whole corn have the lowest intake. What I want to explain is that's not necessarily a bad thing. As long as we're getting these cattle to eat 2 to 2.2% of their body weight on a dry matter basis, which would be like 20 to 22 pounds of dry feed for a thousand pound steer, that's really okay. If I look at average daily gain, there is no difference between dry rolled corn, whole corn, and steam flake corn. But high moisture corn is lower. It's about 10% lower in average daily gain. Why? Because in order to make that high moisture corn, it ferments. And we lose starch that's converted to acid to make it ferment. So I have a bias personally against high moisture corn because the reason we have feedlots is to add value to grain. And I don't like giving away 10% right at the beginning just to get my corn in a form that is fermented. Now, if I look at efficiency, which is, and we're going to look at it at feed the game because that's how most people talk about it. It's the pounds of feed required to put on a pound of gain. What I want you to see is that those numbers in red, dry rolled corn at 6.57 and high moisture corn at 6.43, those are not as efficient as either steam flake corn or whole corn. But people will tell you, well, you know, if I feed whole shelled corn, I see a lot of corn in the manure. And the reality of it is, the way we get around that is by reducing the amount of fiber that we feed when we're feeding whole shelled corn diets. The biggest problem that I've run into in my 35 years of working on farms and then feeding cattle myself is the variability that occurs when we try to grind feed. And so I'm gonna show you some pictures about this and talk about it quite a bit more. There's a woman up in Canada, her name's Karen Bucheman, and she did some really good work. She looked at whole cereal grains. And she looked at the number of chews. And, and here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that corn does not necessarily need to be processed in order to get high levels of starch digestibility. Wheat and barley and small grains do because they'll pass through. But here's the other side of this. Young cattle up to about a year of age chew their feed much more than older cows, which tend to gulp it. So if I feed whole corn to a calf that weighs 500 to 800 pounds when it comes in the feedlot, by the time that whole corn gets to the rumen, 
it's already going to be a coarse ground corn, but it's going to be safer than if I ground that corn prior to feeding and created even more surface area because it may reduce the incidence of acidosis. Now, very few feed companies are going to try to sell you whole shelled corn because they make money on processing, but quite frankly, that's their problem. So there are ways that we do use roughage, which we call forage or roughage in feedlots. We use some to help prevent digestive disorders. When you feed a high grain diet, it can't be regurgitated. That, can't, that animal can't chew its cud. But to do this effectively, we really want that forage to be less than an inch. One of the tricks that we use with heavyweight cattle that are getting up over 11 to 1200 pounds that have been on a high grain diet for maybe 150 days is if they're only getting six or seven percent forage, which is the average in commercial feedlots, we may increase that forage to 10% of the diet or maybe two pounds a day. We'll actually get a stimulation in feed intake which increases net energy intake, and those cattle then, they grow a little bit faster. If you feed cattle for very long, and especially if you ever have fed Holsteins, after about 150 days, the term we use is we say they hit the wall. And part of that is that the rumen has just been exposed to so much acid and so little forage for so long that the papillae shrink in size, and we'll talk about that. Another thing that you have to consider, and this was pretty cool research, is that these were, this research was done with cattle fed steam flake diet, and they looked at NDF level of the feed. They looked at chopped alfalfa, which was 40% NDF versus Sudan hay, which was 60%, versus straw, which was 80%, versus cottonseed hulls, which was 86%. And the whole thing came down to, the bottom line was, that higher NDF feeds, such as straw or cottonseed hulls, were a better source of fiber in feedlot diets because the effect of that roughage on net energy gain intake was a direct result of the NDF concentration of the roughage. What's the importance of this? Why would I feed straw versus something like grass hay or alfalfa? Well, it has twice the NDF value. So I only have to feed half as much of it in order to get the same benefit from the fiber. And why is that important? Well, if I can take 10% hay out or 5% hay out of a diet and I can feed 5% more grain, I'm increasing the energy density of that diet and I'm getting more efficient gain and I'm getting higher average daily gain and I'm getting more propionate and I'm getting more marbling. So let's look at some pictures for a while. This is just a picture of corn and the flowery endosperm in the middle would be grits. That's where the starch, is, most of the starch is. The bran and the germ are the protein portions. The vitreous endosperm has protein surrounding the starch granules. So I've talked about not making it too small when we feed it. These are rumen contents from a steer fed a very low fiber, highly processed diet. It looks like a big green milkshake. There was not one piece of feed in that rumen larger than about three eighths of an inch. This steer was not gaining very well at all. Its diet on a spreadsheet looked really good but it was just too small a particle size. It was actually harvested at our meat lab when I was at Ohio State. And this is what happens when you finely grind a diet. The picture on the right is more the way papillae should look. They ought to be separate because all the volatile fatty acids that are produced in this digestion are absorbed by the, through the VFA. The VFAs are absorbed through the papillae. They go to the liver through the bloodstream and are converted into either fat or glucose. The picture on the left that looks kind of like a carpet from the 60s is 
picture of this matted papillae from this steer that wasn't fed enough fiber. And the problem there is that when it mats, there's not nearly as much surface area of the papillae to absorb the VFAs so that even though the animal is eating, it doesn't get full benefit of the diet because it was highly processed and had a great acid load. The other side is when we look closer at that, there were hair follicles that were penetrating. One way you know in feedlots that you are vastly underfeeding a, a, a fiber level is that you'll look at cattle and they'll be licking themselves. That is a sign when you have excessive licking, that is a sign that the cattle don't have enough fiber and they're nervous. Out of this steer, we pulled these hairballs. Those hairballs are solid. We had to cut that uh, hairball on the right with a bandsaw. That occurs when in ruminant cattle, when they don't have enough fiber, and enough is about 10%, and the grain is processed too small. They can't regurgitate, but they have upset stomachs. They have subacute acidosis, so they're licking each other. We call that a stereotypic behavior when we're doing animal welfare audits in feedlots and it's not a good thing. So let's look at what I think, based on my experience, what grind of corn is best. Whole shelled corn on the left there is good up to 10 to 15% fiber. <coughs> Excuse me. On the right, where we have ground corn, that's good above 10 to 15% fiber. That's good up to about 20% fiber. <clears throat> now I have two slides with four pictures on it. And the one thing I want to tell you is that these next four pictures that you're going to see of corn grind, they were ground through a grinder that was set at exactly the same setting. And these are four pictures of corn over four weeks at the research feedlot I, feedlot I ran in Worcester, Ohio. The picture on the left, that's good to about 20 to 25% fiber. The picture on the right that is smaller is good to about 30 or 35% fiber, maybe even up to 40. These two pictures should never be fed. So this came out of our grinders, which were research grinders, and the time and the pressure and the spacing was set. And I'm going back and forth to show you the difference because how did that occur? Okay, we got back and we started checking fields that they were harvested in and the amount that they were dried down. So I have a real message for you here. If corn is harvested in a wet year and it has to go through a lot of drying through a dryer system, it shatters when it's ground. This is one of the biggest problems with ground corn is getting consistency. If you feed these two in a diet with 35% fiber, like a diet that might have 60% corn silage in it, and corn silage is half corn on a dry matter basis, it won't create a problem. You feed these two, and your group of cattle will have acidosis. So how do we look at that and tell whether we are potentially creating acidosis or not. One of the easiest things to do is look at the manure in the pen. So on the left here, I have a picture of normal manure. We will not see this in a feedlot in most cases because all that happens when you get a great mound of manure is that is from a, a diet that's fed a lot of fiber that holds water so that the manure stacks. On the right-hand side is about what I would consider normal manure in a feedlot situation. There is no water. It is not mounded because we're feeding a low-fiber diet. We run into problems when we get manure that looks like these two. On the left-hand side of this picture is manure that you look and it looks like there's some mucus, and there is. That's intestinal lining from the large intestine. That animal is under a lot of stress. 
And you look on the right, that's an animal that's not only under a lot of stress, but it's got severe diarrhea. And here's the problem with these cattle in feedlots when, when they have severe diarrhea. When we get that, it's really hard to control that because we're gonna still keep feeding them a high grain diet the next day. And so we are feeding these cattle to get them to gain and we have to do everything we can to prevent it. I took this picture in a large feedlot and these are cattle with acidosis and they're in a dirt pen. And when you see cattle eating dirt like this, it's called pica. It's an abnormal condition and these are cattle that are severely suffering from acidosis, so they start exhibiting really atypical behaviors. And when they're lined up eating dirt, dirt like this, we have a problem. And so, how do we prevent acidosis? Well, it causes really highly processed grain diets. It creates an abundance of a, a bacteria called Streptococcus bovis that produces a lot of lactic acid, which is why it's called lactic acidosis. Lactic acid is not absorbed as efficiently, and it's a very strong acid. And if you've ever had a Charlie horse from running, let's say that you are in a summer softball league, but you do not normally run, and all of a sudden you're in the outfield and you're chasing balls around, and you get a little cramp in your thigh. That is caused by lactic acidosis from the metabolism of glucose in a muscle. This is the same kind of lactic acidosis that we get in cattle that drops the pH due to the high buildup of lactate. It's a different cause, but it feels the same way to the animal as that Charlie horse does to you. So some symptoms of Acute acidosis, they're listening, they're listless. They just stand around, they hold their head, they have diarrhea, they have a decreased blood bicarbonate, which means a decreased blood pH, and they bloat. Bloat is that extension of the left side. So let me talk about bloat for just a couple minutes here. Because when you see an animal bloating, what's really happened is an acute acidosis. If I have really small particle size grain, or they overeat. They overeat a lot of corn or a lot of grain with a small particle size. The bacteria have a lot of surface area. They digest that feed really quickly. It goes across the papillae to the bloodstream to the liver, and problems start to occur at the liver because it's being presented with too many acids too fast that it can't convert into either fat or into glucose. And so what happens is those acids build up in the bloodstream. And when they build up in the bloodstream, it causes a drop in pH. And one of the outcomes of a drop in blood pH is muscle contractions. Well, that esophagus is a big tube that leads from the mouth to the rumen. And if you ever see one, they're a dark red in color normally. And they're dark red in color normally because they have so many capillaries, so many small blood vessels. So when an animal has acute acidosis and bloat and dies in a feedlot, the first thing we do is we slit the throat and we do a necropsy, which is what you call an autopsy on an animal, and we will find an area that's often very bruised and looks like a, a cauliflower ear on a boxer almost. It's very bruised and it's swollen, and we call that the bloat line. That's where the, the muscle has contracted so much that it just shuts off all passage. Well, when that happens, those cattle that have done that, the bacteria are still in a room and with a lot of feed, and they still keep digesting, and they produce methane and carbon dioxide, which are gases. So the side of the animal bloats up, bloats out on the left-hand side. So we have a couple of treatments for that, and they're neither one very good. We can stomach tube them, which may take it down. I've seen People drench those animals with fats and oils. And the problem is then 
that you have just coated all of the feed in the rumen with oil and the bacteria can't attach, so they do go off feed for three or four days. You can also take a trocar and punch a hole in the side of the animal to release the gas, but those are pretty drastic. And I would much rather prevent acidosis and bloat rather than try to deal with it. So I wanna talk about how we do that in practical terms. The first thing we can do, and the easiest in every commercial feedlot does this, they feed twice a day. If you feed twice a day, you're limiting the amount of starch that those animals can eat at any one point in time, and you get more of a digestion throughout the, the day, 24 hours a day. We can increase the percentage of roughage. I like to add some straw. I like to add about five to 6% straw to a diet because as I said earlier, it has a high NDF level and it still gives me four or 5% more corn, so I'm more efficient. We can feed complementary grain sources and, and I'll talk about that at some later time, but it's different grains that are digested at different rates. Another way of doing this is I might feed 40% whole shelled corn in a diet and 20% coarsely ground corn, complementary, so they're digested at different rates. We adapt animals slowly to a diet from 10 to 14 days and we limit their feed intake. And I'll talk a little bit then about products that we use to minimize lactic acidosis. Go back to here and please remember that our small grains are the fastest digested. Whole corn, dry rolled grain sorghum, they're the slowest. Steam flake corn's kind of intermediate. So I wanna talk about controlling feed delivery. It's really bunk management. It can be automated. It reduces human error, it reduces feed wastage, it reduces metabolic disorders. We can use it to reduce fat content if we want to, and it always improves efficiency of feed utilization. When I'm feeding cattle, I am perfectly fine controlling intake for the entire feeding period so that we don't just feed like they were fed on a dairy situation. In dairies, where they're fed a high forage diet, we have feed in front of them all the time. This is not what we want to do in feedlots. So, feed bunk management. It's the most important operation in a feedlot. We use feed bunk management to maximize animal performance, to minimize digestive disorders, and to keep animals eating a consistent amount of feed. So let's look at how this is done. We have basically a four-point scoring system in feedlots. And what they are is zero would mean no feed remaining in the bunk. A score of a half would mean scattered feed present, most on the bottom of a bunk. They also call this slick bunk management, because, and I'll show you a picture here in a second. A score of one would be a thin uniform layer of feed. A score of two would be 20 to 50% of the previous day's feeding. And then we have scores of three and four so that we never want to hit. So this, Slide on the left shows a score of zero. You see the little spot in the middle looks like an animal has licked it. That is where the slick bunk management comes into play. A score of one half would be hold. A score of zero, I would increase feed 5% that day. I never increase feed two days in a row. If I increased feed 5% today, on Thursday, I would leave them at that same intake on Friday. If on Saturday I came in and the feed bunk looked like what they were on that one half, I would leave them the same. I am fine leaving cattle that have that half until they clean up the bunk two days in a row, and then I'll increase them 5%. And an important thing we have to keep in mind, 
is that forage digestibility at best is about 50% digestible, 45 to 50%. Grain digestibility is about 95% to 98% digestible. The energy density of forages is, is half the energy density of grain. So if I'm looking at a diet composition, my corn has twice as much net energy for maintenance and net energy for gain as my hay, and it's twice as digestible. So every pound of grain intake gives me four times more, twice the energy density times twice the digestibility, four times more energy to that animal than that same pound of hay would have. So we have to keep in mind the feeds are totally different from an energy standpoint. If I see a feed monk score of one, I hold or reduce feed intake by 5%. If it's still a one the next day, I reduce it another 5%. I want to avoid this on the other side here, on the right side where I have a two. I see a lot of feedlots that have, their bunks always look like this, and they are very rarely profitable feedlots. And I'll explain why here right now. So there was some work done by Robbie Pritchard in South Dakota, and he used yearling steers. <clears throat> and I'm going to call lot A. They were steers fed using slick bunk management, so designed that the cattle would only eat fed what they would eat in each 24-hour period. Their bunks were supposed to look like these two. The lot B steers were fed so that there was always excess feed available in each 24-hour period. They were made to look like this so that whenever an animal came up, it had feed available. So this is the data from this. The controlled steers, <clears throat> they ate 20.2 pounds per day. The lot B steers ate 19.7 pounds per day. This was over about 150, 155 day study. So there was no difference on dry matter intake. The average daily gain of the steers that were fed controlled intake was 3.78 pounds a day versus 2.07. That's an 82% improvement in average daily gain controlling intake. Well, folks, most people don't think that when they see this, that it will result in an 80% improvement in average daily gain versus this. These cattle just have to be underfed, uh, especially on the, the one half which I'm saying to shoot for. Now, why? On feed to gain, that lot A that it was using that score of, of one half as its goal, they only took 5.28 pounds of feed per pound to gain versus those that always had feed available that took nine and a half. That's an 80% improvement in feed efficiency. And keep in mind what I said. The reason we have feedlots is to market grain at an added value. And folks, if I can market beef with only 5.3 pounds of feed versus I'm marketing beef at 9.5 pounds of feed, it is much more efficient to do lot A. But rather than me telling you that, let me show you why that happened. Okay, <clears throat> on the top is lot A, and this is the dry feed delivery. Well, this average is somewhere, let's just say they're around 20 is the average. About 80 to 85 percent of an animal's total feed intake in a feedlot goes to maintenance on that hierarchy of nutrient use of maintenance, development, growth, and fattening. So 85 percent of 20 is 17 pounds. If I just take my finger and I run at 17 pounds, I see that after they're on feed every day that they're fed, for that 55 days, they're eating in excess of maintenance requirements. Now, if I go down here to lot B at the bottom, and I run my finger across where 17 pounds is, roughly halfway between that 15 and that 20, I see that on about half those days, their feed intake was lower. Why? It has to do with acidosis. It has to do with cattle that are subacute acidotic and overeat one day and then undereat the next day. 
I want you to think of your Thanksgiving meal. How many of you had a bellyache three hours after your Thanksgiving meal and are sitting around falling asleep on a couch? And then the next day are not all that hungry. That's what happens in cattle. Also, if I have a weather event come through like these rains that we've been having, well, when it's really rainy, cattle don't feel like eating. But if they know that there's competition and that if they don't eat, someone else will, they'll get up and they'll go eat. What you want is when your feed truck goes by a feed bunk, you want to, we have what's called a rule of thirds. You want a third of the cattle waiting on them when that feed truck goes by. You want a third of the cattle getting up, starting to get up or look like they're going to come to the feed bunk and you want about a third not paying attention. Those third not paying attention are the less aggressive cattle. They'll come up and eat a few minutes later, maybe 15, 20 minutes later. But when you have feed always there, very few cattle pay attention when you come to the feed bunk. And so we get this on the bottom. And I just want to go back here because when, when these are pretty consistent. And when we can improve average daily gain and feed efficiency like this, just by managing a feed bunk, it's one of the reasons that the best thing you can do if you start feeding cattle is to get a set of scales if you're feeding a small amount and get a TMR with a set of scales and use them if you're feeding a larger amount. So just to wrap this part up, why was efficiency improved with bunk management? They met their maintenance requirement every day. They had enough to meet their development, lean growth, reproduction, and fattening. It goes back to that hierarchy of nutrient use. They had enough to meet their demands. And don't forget that 70-80% of feed intake is used for maintenance in cattle, leaving only 20 to 30% for growth. So when we feed them in a, in a system using feed bunk management, we get a more consistent feed intake. We reduce overeating. We reduce metabolic diseases. And when we control it on a daily basis so that there is just enough feed there, that's where we're running the optimum level on a feedlot. We want all the cattle getting something to eat so that we have less feed left over for those animals that are really aggressive eaters because those are the ones that get subacute acidosis if we don't control feed intake. So. Let's look at some additives to improve performance and reduce acidosis because one of the things that the feedlot industry really big is really big on is using technology and feeding technologies. So I'm going to cover two that we've worked with a lot. In conventional feedlot situations, using an ionophore such as Romensin to reduce lactic acidosis is an absolute essential in my opinion. Um, over 95% of the cattle in the United States are fed in a conventional system. All of them use some kind of an ionophore. If you are going for the all-natural market because menensin is an ionophore antibiotic, there's products like Amifirm or Levucel SC. They increase the lactic acid uptake. I'll, I'm going to go through both of these. You combine those with good bunk management and prevent fluctuations in feed intake, and you've got a pretty good way of reducing acidosis. So if I look at rumensin and amifirm, rumensin decreases feed intake. It causes more propionate production with a less feed intake, so the cattle gain the same, and it improves efficiency. Because it reduces that, intake and improves efficiency and they gain the same. That's why it's used in nearly every commercial feedlot. Amifirm makes sense on all natural programs. It does not reduce feed intake, it actually increases it. But it also, because it increases it, it increases total propionate production and it increases efficiency. It's more expensive than Amif or than Romensin, and it's why Romensin is, is such a consistent use product in commercial feedlots. So ionophores like Romensin, they are ionophore antibiotics. 
in the rumen, they inhibit the growth, growth of gram-positive organisms like Streptococcus bovis that produces lactic acid. Streptococcus bovis is gram-positive, and they increase, rumensin increases the growth of gram-negative organisms. And by doing that, they alter the population of rumen, they alter the microbial population towards more propionate producers and away from lactate producers. They decrease methane production because as you increase propionate, it's more efficient and you get less carbon loss as carbon dioxide and methane, so you get less heat of fermentation, less methane production, you increase the efficiency of energy utilization, and you also get a sparing of amino acids normally that go to gluconeogenesis, which actually improves your efficiency in the liver as well. So, Amifirm, on the other hand, for all natural, it increases the uptake of lactate in the rumen by increasing the strains of bacteria that increase uptake of lactic acid. It works to stabilize rumen pH. We did some work in Ohio that was sponsored by NCBA, and we used a 76% corn diet. Uh, three grams of Amifirm resulted in a 7% improvement in feed efficiency. Um, those cattle gained, uh, their efficiency was that they had 4.8 pounds of feed per pound of gain. So I think with good bunk management, we absolutely have the ability to feed cattle in a smaller operation just as efficiently as we do in large operations. I will say this, when, when we are in western feedlots and we are using a lot of rumensin and we are using steam flake diets, you have to understand one of the reasons steam flake diets are so important in western feedlots is that those feedlots don't own all the cattle. And when they can steam flake their grains, it's very expensive, but they get a 99% starch digestion. By getting that high a starch digestion versus whole corn at 96 or 97, when you're working with tens of thousands of cattle, that's a lot less corn that you have to buy. The other side of that is, that they are adding 10 or 11% moisture. And when you're adding moisture and you're selling corn to a customer, you're selling corn at a value added to you. It's kind of like buying a frozen chicken breast. If you ever buy a frozen chicken breast in a store, you'll look on it and it'll say something like 14% water added. Well, if you're running a commercial feedlot, you can sell some water is corn, that's also a benefit. So my final thoughts on this. For any size feedlot, acidosis is preventable with bunk management, controlling feed particle size, and controlling forage levels. Manure can be evaluated to determine if some of the cattle have digestive issues, but it is only one diagnosis tool. An important thing that I didn't have time to go into, nervous cattle are more susceptible to acidosis than calm cattle. In commercial feedlots, when that feed truck goes by, I train people to write down the ear tag number of the nervous cattle. If cattle are seen being nervous three days in a row running back and forth, we'll pull them out of a pen and we'll put them in a pen with other nervous cattle because one really nervous animal can mess up the efficiency of a of 100 animals by three to 5% because cattle go to the same area of the feed bunk all the time. And we can talk about that later, but nervous cattle disrupt that community at the feed bunk. And finally, improper bunk management, feed delivery, and overly processed grains are the most common causes of acidosis and the biggest areas of economic loss in feedlots. Economic losses in feedlots are not due to cattle dying. The biggest economic losses are the losses when we give up efficiency of how we're doing things.
And finally, thanks for listening to this presentation. For those of you who may watch it later, um, the survey for whether this was useful or not is shown there in the middle of the stake. And if you can type that in uh, on your computer and go to there, you can take the survey. At this question, or at this point in time, I'm hoping we can do some questions and we'll figure this out if Jacob's able to see and hear and I'm able to see questions. I can, I figured out what my problem was. Um, I had my microphone on and my speakers muted, so that's why I couldn't hear you. Okay, good. Uh, so that was my fault. But yeah, you guys have the ability to reach down there in the corner of the screen like I showed you and unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone. Uh, I don't wanna unmute everybody at the same time because that could cause a lot of feedback. Uh, you're welcome to ask a question in person. I'm also watching the chat box. If, you assume, if you'd rather type a question in, I'll be glad to read it so that the group can hear it. Jacob, I do not see the chat box on my end. Okay, you have to, you have to open it. Go down to the bottom uh, next to your share screen button, and there's one that says chat. Okay. Let me try to figure this out. <clears throat> In your Zoom window. That's telling me to join a meeting. No, 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 not that one. Yeah, I, I don't. Stop sharing your screen first and foremost. That's probably one thing we can do here. I mean, well, you know, this would be beautiful if I could get back to the Zoom. I think I can do it for you. Hang on just one second. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, this is Robert Smalley. Yes. Uh, if you're feeding a pelleted feed, like 14% beef developer, yeah, it's going to be uh, like the fine corn. Yeah. If you're using fattened cattle. How many pounds a day are you feeding? Because the other thing is that it's total feed intake that gets really tricky here. Yeah, well, we're, we're kind of using that uh, uh, bump manager that you was talking about. We're, we're gradually working them up to where they're <coughs> eating almost all, they, all they'll take in. Yeah. If you put fat one up for like in the freezer or something. Yep, when you're using a, a total, are you use, is it a totally pelleted feed or is it a pelleted feed that you feed with whole shelled corn? It's a, it's a, it's a pelleted 14% beef developer with uh, rumensin in it. Okay. Yeah, with those kinds of feeds, they tend to be formulated with a little more byproducts in them, a little more fiber from a safe okay. point. They're really important to, when you do that, to make sure that you do not um, overfeed so they are once cattle are adapted to a diet they're actually pretty darn good at 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 figuring things out it sounds to me like you're doing exactly what you should be doing that with bunk management try to keep that at that zero to one half score and right. as they get a little more feeding them twice a day is a really good thing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Okay. Well, I have to say, if there are no other questions, um, this has been an interesting experience trying to teach an old dog new tricks because this is the first time I have ever given a talk looking only at my computer screen. <laughs> so, well, we have to do what we can do. Yeah, so I will say thanks for um, attending. Uh, and you know how to get in, in touch with your local county extension agent.
and with Jacob and with me. And if you have any uh, further follow-up, um, I'm pretty easy to find. Thank you, Dr. Fluharty. I would remind you, please, before you sign off, to take a look in that chat box if you scroll back up to the top. Again, that's down there on the bottom of your screen. Uh, the, the link to the survey is there, so you don't have to type in that URL. Uh, if you are going to be listening remotely after we've come, we went offline, uh, again, that link is on Dr. Fluharty's last slide. You can type it in and take a survey there. We would sure appreciate you doing that. Just a reminder, I broke in and shared my screen here so you can see next week uh, will be the last seminar in this series. Trey, I can see your comment in the chat box. I certainly appreciate that, and hopefully we'll be able to keep doing these types of series in the future. I think they work pretty well for, for a lot of folks. But next week, um, Dr. Dan Thompson from Kansas State University will be on uh, talking about, Dr. Dr. Blue already talked about buying reputation cattle. We talk to you guys a lot about producing reputation cattle. Uh, he's going to get more into the idea of how, how do you realize the value of those cats. So talking about some of these reputation sales and things like that. Um, this, uh, Bubba, I see your question there in the box. This talk has been recorded. As soon as I finish here, I will upload it to my YouTube page and we'll post a link at ugabeef.com. Okay, we'll have a blog site there. You can scroll down and the link will be in the blog site. Davis, scroll all the way back up. It's the first thing in the chat box there, buddy.